All right. Well, again, welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us for this really interesting monthly chat with Poet Gold, leading with Artivism. And tonight, the uh, guest is Saprina. Uh, before we get started, I want everybody to know that we are uh, recording this, and it's also being um, it's going to be available at the Arts Mid Hudson YouTube channel next week. Closed captions are available. To activate, click on the CC button at the bottom of your screen and then press show subtitle. You can submit your questions via the chat. Click the chat button at the bottom of your screen and the chat will open. The views and opinions expressed are those of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of Artsman Hudson. So I'm going to give a little introduction. This is um, this is a monthly program that Poet Gold came to us, and it is her program. And we are all of us at Arts Med Hudson are providing technical support to make this happen, and we're really proud to partner with her. So I want to tell you a little bit about Poet Gold. If you haven't had the pleasure of hearing her work, uh, she is a rare talent who grabs you by the heart and says, "Recognize, poet." author, performer, songwriter, community artivist, and speaker. Bettina Poet Gold Wilkerson is pushing the boundaries of poetry and the spoken word. Living with a chronic illness since childhood, Poet Gold, or as she is affectionately known as Gold, brings a soul-searching insight about the human existence, love, dreams, challenges, and triumph. Poet Gold has won numerous awards and grants, and she is the founder of the Poetry Fest, which happens every year in Poughkeepsie. She is also um, one of our Artivist Awards for the Dutchess County Executive Arts Awards. Our guest, Saprina, studied sculpture at the University of Arts in Philadelphia, but gained the bulk of her knowledge of her craft from working in the field of promotional prop making. Her clients have included Annie Leibowitz, Apple Computer, Bloomingdale's, and the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. After 9-11, having lived in the neighborhood at the time, Saprina decided she would focus solely on her own artwork, which discussed environmental, societal, and political issues. Saprina has shown in Chelsea, Central Park, Governor's Island, Brooklyn, Chicago, Scottsdale, Harlem, Newark, Southampton, and the Hudson Valley. She's received grants from the Puppin Foundation, Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, the Decentralized Grants from Arts Mid Hudson. But most recently, she is going to receive the Dutchess County Executive Art in Public Places Award this October 7th. So I hope you'll all save that date and celebrate with us all. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Lilia Perez, our, um, who is, here and managing all the gallery, and she's going to lead you through a little tour. Thank you, Linda. Thanks, everyone. So thank you for being here. And we're going to take a look at some Saprina's work. So Saprina, if we could also chat with me and kind of guide us through the virtual gallery we created of your work. And So in order to view the virtual gallery of Saprina's work, you can do so from our website and then under programs, scroll down to leading with artivism. This is where the gallery will remain on view through the month. Um, and so down here, we'll find a virtual gallery, which includes some of Saprina's work. So hi, Saprina. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, we're going to start over here. Just make this and take a look at your Say Their Names project. Could you tell us a little bit about this project? Sure. Um, I think after George Floyd was killed um, last spring, um, I and so many in the country were devastated and um, I felt like I needed to create something around um, uh, the names of all the people who have been killed and how their families and everyone, how many people are really affected by that. So um, I wanted to make a puppet that I could use and let other people use 
in protests. That was the, the main uh, idea of it. Uh, simultaneously, um, I found out that Gold had also created something called Say Their Names. Um, and um, so we decided to do a venture together. Um, we're going to do a, a performance uh, video and Gold is going to recite her poem and this character, which is based on the goddess Themis, uh, the Greek goddess Themis, uh, the blind justice goddess, um, will be accompanying her along with um, some other people. So you have to wait until that happens. Um, we are in the throes of a little fundraising on that and we expect to film in September. Thank you. And then could you tell us a little bit about this piece? Sure. Um, this piece is, uh, I, I subtitle it really Hand of God, but um, its longer name is HOG version OS 2020, uh, referring just to computers. Uh, it's about, uh, and this was done during COVID also. And for me, it was about uh, all the hopes and dreams that we all have that everyone's reaching for. So the hand, uh, that the human hand is covered in prayers from 20 different languages, all prayers to God. And then the God hand is covered with zeros and ones because I do feel that we kind of create our own God. And so this gets into some of the more the sculptural, you know, the Say Their Names project is a puppet and it's quite different from some of the assemblage work and the work you do using Dietria. So, and then this is a incredible portrait of Colin Kaepernick. Could you tell us about this piece? Sure, this, this came about um, shortly after Trump was elected and I was uh, devastated and um, not sure how to continue to make art. Um, with our country being in such, um, in, as far as I was concerned, such terrible throws. Um, and I decided that um, instead of complaining about Trump being in office, that I would instead focus on some real people that I thought were heroes um, and that reached out and reached across um, their personal safety and their personal uh, gain to express what they felt. So as you can see in the eyes, both of the eyes have uh, about uh, 10 images each that rotate that are uh, different people, different, even from different countries that are kneeling because Kaepernick affected. So he affected the world with what he did. So he was my first American hero. And could you tell us about this collaborative project that you did with the city of Kingston? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Poughkeepsie, excuse I, me. <laughs> I knew what you meant. <laughs> so, uh, so I approached the city of Poughkeepsie and asked them if I could paint um, one of their garbage trucks. I was gonna, I always had the idea of painting all of them, but of course the first one, I had to get my nose in the tent as they say. So, um, and everyone told me that the city was never going to let me paint the garbage trucks, but uh, it was about a public project that I was going to be working on that was canceled or postponed for a long time because of COVID. Uh, and the name of that project was, uh, we're all in this together and it's about our consumption. So I thought it was really appropriate to have that written on the side of a garbage truck where most of our consumption ends because almost everything we buy ends up being thrown away, almost everything. So, um, so, and I also wanted to respect the, um, the people who pick up our garbage, people who drive the trucks. I wanted to show them some respect and show them some love. And uh, we have some photos of a large scale installation that you just did called We Are the Forest. Could you tell us a bit about this project? Um, this project was partially funded by, by the decentralization grant uh, for individual artists. It was, and it was funded because it was my first art installation. So um, I wanted to create a forest made out of everything that we throw away and started collecting a year ago, planning to do this, 
paint cans, which I see as um, the carbon footprint uh, metaphor. Um, they're like the base, they're the ground, and then all the trees and bushes and shrubs are growing out of um, those elements. So this one was this installation, which was at Queen City 15 for April and May of this year, was 18 feet by 32 feet. And Lisa Winnicka, who's also in this picture, also participated in this. She created these um, creatures that are called, called contumbles, which are basically na nature spirits. So we worked together on this. And um, it was really fun collecting um, work, mm -hmm. collecting from people, so. And then this was a, a byproduct of that exhibit, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, I ended up with many paint can lids from all the paint cans and um, just got inspired to put them together. And I thought it just looks so much like people, like us all together. So I titled it All of Us. I showed it at Queen City 15 um, and it was sold the night that, um, the, the night of the opening of that show to someone who I think is watching this. <laughs> So um, I have many more cans, uh, lids now because I'm still collecting cans because like, the forest is going to travel and get bigger and I'm looking forward to creating one of these that's like about 20 feet long. I think it'll be fun. Right, this piece, your uh, DNA totem. The DNA totem has just uh, moved on Monday, this Monday. It's now on the walkway on the PK side. If any of you live in the area, please go visit it. Uh, it's about 10 feet tall and it's a double helix DNA strand embedded with trash. Uh, it talks about our consumption and our relationship to our trash. Um, and how we are the only creatures on the planet that desecrate the homes, the home we live in. So it's a fun piece. Go visit it. And we have a couple more pieces to look at. This one's called While We Were Sleeping. This was um, uh, me pondering for a long time as to how uh, Donald Trump got to be elected. And um, so that's where this piece came from. So while we were sleeping, um, while we weren't really paying attention and weren't really being that involved, including myself, I include myself along with many people that I know and love, um, weren't paying attention too much to what was going on with our politics. And um, I believe now that really for a couple of decades, this has kind of been coming down the pike. We just weren't watching. So the figure is sleeping. And there's books behind the figure and all the books are fairy tales. So we were reading fairy tales and hoping for the best. And then the clock, inside the clock, I don't think I have a shot of that close up, but inside the clock, there's another uh, photo uh, loop that goes through mm -hmm. different, different laws that were changed to um, um, have the individual lose power. Uh, and have corporations gain power and things like that. So while we were sleeping, these laws were changing, which gave us a lot less power. So, and that's Donald Trump in the front. He's coming off a spiral like a little cuckoo clock. <laughs> and, and then uh, one last one. This is one that's still in progress, right? You're, you're working on this one now? Yes. Yeah, faith and hope. Um, and this came about during COVID also, uh, which I know many artists struggled with art making during uh, the last four or five years. So I was two and um, I decided that I was not going to have an intention on this piece, which is very rare for me. Anybody who knows my work, I, I, I always have an intention and it's in your face, I'm not subtle. Um, that's how I work and I decided I'm just going to create a piece with no intention. So I glued together all my pieces of foam scrap that I had from all my other projects that were sitting in my shed just haphazardly and then I looked at it and I thought, oh, I guess it's a bird and carved it into a more, more of a bird 
And then I just started applying um, different materials that people have given me. Um, the base under it is a Tibetan prayer flag that was in my backyard until it got shredded enough. So that's where a lot of the colors come from. So it's called Hope and Faith for me because I still feel like it came out with something or I'm coming out with something that's pretty powerful, even though I had no intention when I made it. So. Thank you for walking us through, Sabrina, and, and giving us so much insight into your work. And just so everyone knows, this will remain on view and on our website. You can take a look at your own time. And um, when you're looking at the pieces, feel free to click up in the information button for more information and a link to Sabrina's website. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Gold. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you so much, Lilia. What a wonderful exhibit. Um, wow, 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 as, as, as they say. You know, something jumped out at me um, while you were going through the exhibit and something that you said about the, the city or someone expressed to you about the city and, and the buses. And, and uh, it grabbed hold of me. Everyone told me the city will never let me do it. Does that give you fuel? I, I know certainly for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tell me I can't do it, and I am so there. Absolutely. <laughs> Just watch me. Yeah. I, I and, I'm, like and I am a firm believer, and I tell uh, many, every intern that I've ever gotten, whether they've wanted to hear it or not, always ask. Always ask, because if you don't ask, the answer is no. You have nothing to lose. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. How are you doing, my friend? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome for being here today. Um, we, got a lot of, we got a lot of wonderful questions um, from people. So I'm just going to go right at it and have a conversation with you in between the questions. Okay. But one of the questions that came in says, does a found material dictate your theme or do you find materials to serve your themes or is it a little bit of both? And can you give some examples? Um, I, as I, as I was just saying from the last piece, actually, the bird, um, mostly I, I have an intention and then I find the objects that are appropriate for the, um, the best, most economical communication. Um, so like for the forest, you know, I had to, um, when I had the idea of the forest, I then had to get hundreds of empty paint cans and hundreds of objects to stand in those empty paint cans. So I uh, put out a call on my IG account, which is how I usually do it, and ask people um, to, um, to donate materials. And they do, they're very willing. I mean, people love to get rid of their trash. So it, it's, it's a win-win situation <laughs> for, um, yeah, for, for both of us. So um, once in a while, an object finds me, I'd like to say, and demands that I create something with it immediately, and, um, and I obey. So I do try and listen. You obey. You, you, you listen to that calling. I do. I try to. Yeah. Absolutely. Some, some people call that the Holy Ghost, you know? <laughs> you, you, listen, you listen to that calling, that, that inner being in you. It's definitely holy, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Why, why be an artist, you know, versus, I guess, what some would say an artist? I mean, are they, are they intertwined? You know, what motivates you in this process of creating your art? Um, that comes up a lot because people, um, some people don't uh, really appreciate when artists state their opinions in this way. Um, so um, Elizabeth Gilbert is a writer, um, does all kinds of books, but um, she wrote uh, a, 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 a small quote about um, the arrogance of belonging. And she was referring to artists when she wrote that. And um, that's what it is for me. I feel like I belong on this planet. I'm here with everyone else. I have ideas that I think are worthy of being born into physicality, as I think many of you guys do have that too. Um, and so, and I feel like there's enough um, stuff out in the world 
that I want what I put in the physical world to be something that a lot of people can gain something from. Even if that, what, what they gain is um, a conversation, an open conversation that maybe they never had before, or maybe hopefully I've educated somebody on something they didn't know about before. Um, I, you know, I I'm believe in the power of one. I believe in the tipping point. I think people can change the world one at a time. So that's why I do art that um, pertains to our world rather than my internal world. So there wasn't a place, well, let me ask, was there ever a place in your life where you felt like you were born an artist and and so this is who I need to be as, as the artist that I am to my voice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I actually don't remember a time when I didn't think I was born an artist. Include, I mean, from very young, I felt, you know, um, not really part of the world in a certain sense. I felt a little different in, in that sense. And I was really, I was good at art. So it kind of worked out. <laughs> I'm glad, it worked. glad it worked out. You came to the Hudson Valley. <laughs> yeah. uh, someone had a question here. Uh, what is, yes, what is the figure made of um, while, while we were sleeping? And did you make that figure or was it gifted? Oh, yeah, no, I mean, I carved the figure, everything, uh, any of the uh, figures are hand carved by me. Um, and I carve it out of foam that I buy at Home Depot. Uh, the insulation foam, it's about two inches thick and comes two foot by eight foot legs and I glue them together um, and then start carving back. So it's subtractive carving. And that particular figure on that piece is then covered with sawdust because she's sleeping. So I do throw humor in my work all the time. And that was one example of humor. Humor. <laughs> could, you, could you talk a little bit about, um, have there been any obstacles for you in trying to achieve what you hope to achieve in, in, in your artistic expression and sharing your body's work? Um, sure, a million, you know, uh, as, as any artist, I think, would have to say, there's always obstacles. First of all, there's so many artists um, in the world today and so many ways to share art that um, that's a challenge already because, you know, I'm one in millions and millions and millions of people. So, um, of course, the financial side is a real obstacle. Uh, I haven't had obstacles in the sense of creative, creatively, like a, a block or anything. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, very fortunate, very lucky. I guess the closest time I had that was when I was distraught about Donald Trump being elected and trying to figure out what to make. Mm -hmm. During that time, that was probably the closest time I ever had to, oh my God, uh, what should I do next? You know, um, I have a list here of probably, you know, 60 sculptures I want to do. I'm going to have to live till I'm 130 to do them all. So I have to stay healthy. Stay healthy. <laughs> stay healthy. Stay healthy. Yeah, I'm going to ask you a question about that too, about all your sculptures and, and, um, you know, how are you going to, have you, you know, made a plan to uh, store some of your work, save some of your work, where did your work go? You know, because artists struggle with that. You know, we paint, we create, we write. Huge struggle. Huge struggle for sculptors in particular and sculptors like me that like to work big. I mean, go figure. I mean, it's really, uh, it's it's a problem. I always tell two-dimensional artists I'm jealous of them because they can, you know, slide their work and they can store a lot more work than I can. Um, but it is, it's, a, it's a, a true challenge. And I don't have the answers right now. Actually, I am facing um, having to think about working smaller. Hmm. And um, I'm not ever going to stop working until the day I die or until my hands don't work anymore or whatever. But um, 
but I do, I will, I will run out of storage space. So any of you out there have some money, want to buy some art? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I sell once in a while, but certainly not enough to um, support myself and not enough to clear out the rooms that I have in my studio where I'm storing work. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason actually Colin Kaepernick is a great example, the American hero, I wanted to do, I still would like to do, 10 American heroes that size. But after making that piece, I just, I can't physically do that because I don't have the storage space for 10 of those pieces. Right. Had he sold, I would, I would made another, you know, that's, that's just a cold hard fact of what I do. And it's unfortunate um, for the visual artists who make things that actually have to be stored in room temperature, con you know, temperature control rooms. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Well, anyone out there that's listening? Yeah. First piece that you can create the other piece. I'd like to see the 10, 10 individuals, the 10 heroes and sheroes that you, that you could create. Um, your background is, is, is evident and in the theatrical of, of, of your work that's shown. But what are the artists who have inspired and informed your practice? Who are some of your influences? I, um, that's a hard one for me. I, I don't, I, I am not really well versed in a bunch of artists, to be honest with you. I mean, Jump is the father of found object work. He approached it very differently. I mean, I guess my forest is close to the way Duchamp approaches uh, found object work, which is that the object, when it's um, taken out of its environment and moved into a different environment, uh, makes the viewer um, look at it in a different way, mm -hmm. and hence becomes art. Uh, that is what's happened in the forest for me, taking a, you know, um, a rake and instead, instead of you seeing it in the gutter and ignoring it because it's another piece of trash, I stand it up and add other rakes around it. And now you're looking at it from a different point of view. But so, yeah, I mean, he's, he's the father of what, how I started doing what I'm doing. Um, a friend of mine, China Marks, very much influenced me in my 20s and 30s. She used to work with found objects. She now does sewing. She draws with a sewing machine. Um, she's fantastic. So um, I really think I'm more touched just by people mm -hmm. uh, like you. You know, people that I know, um, people that um, aren't famous artists have definitely influenced me more than, you know, some famous artists. Do you ever slow down? Do you ever have a, a sort of um, a challenge of creative slowdown at any point in, in your journey? Have you ever faced that, that wall? Um, again, only the only time was with when Trump was elected uh, that I slowed down a little bit to figure out what to do next. But uh, really what would slow me down is that, um, you know, the kitchen sink broke and I have to get a repair person in or just life, just right. like, you know, I take care of the building of uh, our house because um, I'm good at that, but that does take time. So just the balance that every artist, every, every person I know talks about of their creative life to their monotonous mundane kind of just get through the day life um can interfere that's what would interfere more than anything for me. I, know as a, I know as a writer um, a lot of writers fear sort of that writer's block and um, i don't i don't really believe in writer's block i just think that okay i'm just not writing at this moment and and surrender to that allow that allow that to to be because in the fight of going, I have writer's block, I have writer's block, I have writer's block. You create so much anxiety, you know, for yourself. I, I believe you create anxiety for yourself, which then would create a writer's block. You just had a space where you're just not writing and, and it's okay, go do something else. I think that's a fantastic way to look at it because I agree with you. Um, things can snowball into 
um, a place you, you don't want to get to. So to minimize when you're not working at your high capacity, right? Minimize what that is and um, just go through it instead of saying, oh my God, I can't create anymore. I don't know how to create anymore. I'm never going to make another good sculpture. Right. You know, it's not yeah. productive. Yeah, let's, let's go have some sake. That's what we can do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Uh, what galleries are you in? Are you showing any right now? Any galleries? Um, yes, I am. Sh there's going to be an opening on August 12th in uh, El Barrio in, in Harlem, PS 102. Um, and that's a um, Women Celebrate Women show uh, that's going on. So it'll be going on for, I think, a month or six weeks or something like that. So if you're in Harlem or anything, you can find out more information from me through this, I guess, you can get in touch with me. Um, that is the only show I'm in right now, but again, my the public work, uh, the DNA Totem is um, up on the walkway. We're gonna be doing a lot of programming around that in the fall. Uh, we're working out dates and everything now. They're a great group of people. I'm really happy to work with them and they're totally interested in working with the city of Poughkeepsie and artists in the Hudson Valley. So that's fantastic. And then if you want to see Colin Kaepernick, he is in person at Queen City 15 uh, Gallery, which is at 317 Main Street. That is a gallery that I'm part owner in and Kaepernick will be there until Sunday. And then he comes down for our next show. I think the Kaepernick piece was one of the first pieces I saw of yours. Um, during a, the, um, the art, I'm losing my words here, during the summer, early June. Yeah, yeah, yeah. during the uh, studio tour. Uh, yes, yeah, studio, yes, that's, yes, yes. That's yes. when we met, yes, yes. That's when we met, that's when we met. The big boot was outside of your home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the shoe, yeah. Yeah, the big shoe, you know, yeah. one to climb on it, just like a kid in the park, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> great, great. great work. So someone asked a question. I don't know if you answered it. I think you might have, but I'm going to go back to it. Um, what do you mean by artivism? You want to take it? Yeah, I just think that I, for me, I, um, I want a better world. I want a world with true equality for everybody. I want a world that's more peaceful, more tolerant. And so I feel like if I can do anything to promote those things, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm driven to do. It's, um, that's my goal. And if I can change one or two minds in my lifetime, yay, I'm happy. You know, that drop of water and that ring that goes out, it affects, it affects more people as it goes down. So. And there was another part to this question. Um, I think we'll probably both address it. Do you think that more people of minority groups should get art grants? Yeah, I remember that question. Um, so I have a couple of thoughts on that, uh, but I'm going to, I know you and I talked about this before, so I'm going to take this one side. Look, uh, thousands of years, the world has been white male dominated. That's, that's, the way it's been. And we are in the throes of changing that now as, as, as a globally, I believe. And, um, and that's, um, that's what's got to happen. We have to change the way our world has been working for a long time. And it's going to take a lot of work. Uh, it's going to take a lot of art. It's going to take a lot of policy changes and things like that. Um, so, but at the same time, you go to Artsman Hudson and talk to them about grants or opportunities. They are there for you, no matter what you look like or who you are. So there's plenty of opportunities out there, um, but there will be more to come. That's why I just said about it. Yeah, yeah. I I, I found the question um, <clears throat> interesting because, you know, as a person of color. Uh, I always feel that, you know, maybe there should be more outreach, but at the same time, on the flip side, there's an, there's an outreach that we have to practice as well as people of color, because there are programs 
that, that are out there um, and that may seem to be unaccessible, but actually are accessible with a little digging and a little, you know, aligning yourself and reaching out to people and asking uh, questions. I mean, there are definitely systemic issues in, in some cases. I know when I first came to the, uh, the Hudson Valley, um, I wouldn't say that the arts community was, was really as open as it was initially the, the first year I got here. And then the second year, it, it, it changed. And I, and I think I want to, um, I hope she doesn't get embarrassed, but I'm, I want to credit, uh, you know, Linda Martin Reed for that, you know, as well, because, you know, she definitely did a outreach uh, to different communities with, within the Hudson Valley. And so, um, so it created a more welcoming environment. So I think it works, it works both ways with the access of, of programming. You know, I agree with you that there are things that need to change, but, you know, on the, on the other side, um, I think that, yes, we have to just work a little harder as well as uncovering some of those things that, that are there. So, but thank you for the question. Um, yeah, and I actually want to just say one more thing about that too, that um, what I found, because I work with youth um, painting the garbage trucks, and um, I also am doing a mentorship with, um, with a uh, Latinx woman who lives in Middle Maine, uh, Poughkeepsie, which for people who don't know, is a Latinx area of Poughkeepsie. And um, their voices are not heard right now in the, in the political scenes. So, you know, they're, they're a lot of things, they're, they're very um, mis unrepresented. Um, and so this woman's a great artist, she's a great sculptor. Uh, she makes uh, pinatas like for a living for parties and stuff, but she's very, very, very talented. And so I approached her about um, creating a float for the Poughkeepsie Celebration of Lights Parade. I said, look, it's you, I'm, your baby, you do the whole, you, your idea, everything, I will just help you figure out how to make it because I know how to do things like that. And then you can bring it, participate in the parade. She would never have thought of participating in the parade. She would have thought that that wasn't allowed. Mm -hmm. So my reason for doing this is to get her to see, no, you are allowed in this. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to teach you. And then next year, I want you to teach somebody else. Yeah. So um, that's how I see it goes. Yeah. So each, the room gets one. bigger and bigger, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Each one, teach one. Because you, something that you touched upon, when you feel underrepresented, uh, underrepresented you also feel invisible. Yes. When you don't see yourself in a space of a room. And okay. when you feel invisible, you don't want to enter the room. And so, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I love this. If you were not expressing yourself uh, by making and sharing art, would you go crazy? Um, is art oh. necessary? Is art necessary for you to try to change world and people's beliefs? Just ask Joe. <laughs> My husband. <laughs> yeah, a few days go by me not making art. He knows it right away. They'll be like, did you make art today, honey? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, there, it's just an incredible, I don't know what it is, but it's almost like uh, anxiety and ants crawling in my body telling me gonna, I'm going to explode. So it's almost painful, mm -hmm. mm. you know? Uh, it's almost like painful to not make art yeah. on some kind of regular basis. And uh, that's a blessing and a curse, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I, I take it as a blessing, I really do. Yeah, it, it's an expression. I mean, it's, it's a voice that's trying to make its way out. And, and we're simply, um, everyone on here who's an artist is a vessel. Yes. It's a vessel trying to bring that voice ashore. So thank and, you for the question. Yeah, for people who don't, feel their voice that's got to be that's that's got to be real pain and i'm gonna ask this final question how can artists enact justice well i i i think that's a big question for me uh i you know i'm just a little artist here trying to <laughs> do stuff but um I, I do it the way I do it is I, I just try to make stuff uh, from truth. 
I try and uh, I try and go from truth. Uh, I also write letters uh, to people in our government when I hear about things that are absolutely maddening and driving me crazy. And then, uh, like um, you know, like Isabel, the uh, woman I'm working with um, in Middle Maine, I I purposely reached out to her. She's a talented artist and she should be expressing herself. She should feel the ability if she wants to express herself to all of us, not just to her little community. So she wants to do that, obviously, because she's taken me up on this. Uh, and also the garbage trucks. I, I, I use youth, I use minority youth. Um, I want them to have an experience. I want them to feel pride of what they're doing and all that in an, in, you know, in a roundabout kind of way gets to justice and equality. And I think many of you know, I have pieces on, you know, the real straightforward uh, incarceration issue. Um, so that's it. I just make art around the subjects and I also physically live trying to help other people find their voice. Bravo. Plant those seeds. <laughs> Planting the seeds. Absolutely. Sabrina, thank you so very much. I appreciate you so much. I'm, I'm enjoying working with you and collaborating with you and um, I look forward to you, your future work and congratulations on your upcoming award. Thank you so much. And thank everybody for your time. It's the most important thing you can give to somebody. So that you've been willing to give us, um, you know, 45 minutes of your time. I feel blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you, Lilia. Lilia, Arts Hudson, Melissa, Melissa. Melissa, and whoever else is in the back there that's helping out with this. I don't know. <laughs> thank you Thanks so much. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We hope to see you next month. All be blessed. Okay, we're, we're, uh, I just want to again say thank you. Thank you, Poet Gold. Uh, this is an amazing series. Um, thank you, Saprina, for being an amazing guest today. Uh, I can't wait to spend a little more time in the virtual gallery and look at all your work together. Uh, I do want to recognize our amazing staff, Lilia Perez and Melissa Devorgina Thomas, who have put a lot of time and effort into this to make it so beautiful and wonderful. Um, so mark your calendar for next month. We're going, uh, Poet Gold is going to bring Rashad Wright up to the stage and they're going to have a conversation and that date will be August 19th. So we hope you'll join us then. Good night. <laughs>